I'm Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I have been overwhelmed by how positive you guys have been, how many people have watched, and then how many questions and comments have come in based on my very first coffee and questions video. So I was originally planning on only doing one of these videos once a month, but I put out a poll on Instagram and asked you guys if you wanted to see another one, and the answer was clearly a yes that you guys wanted to see more. So here I am, I hear you, I am listening, and I am here to answer some more of your questions that you have maybe commented on previous videos, on the most recent coffee and questions video, and on Instagram. But before I do that, don't forget to subscribe down below so that you never miss a video and potentially don't miss a shout out because I am answering your questions today and in the future. Let's get started. YouTube because I did just put out the poll like probably only like 25 minutes ago so I want to give you guys time to see it and respond and send me your questions. So I'm gonna go to the last YouTube video that I posted the very first coffee and questions video and I'm gonna pull up some of your questions from that video and go from there. This is not practice. I probably should prep some of these questions but that just seems like too much work. First of all Lucy B thank you for your comment. I'm due at the end of February. Girls we're gonna make it. Let's trust our bodies and babies inside. Yes girl hallelujah you can do it. Trust that body and that baby. In the last video I mentioned something about nurses gifts and Wendy Pastor said on gifts for nurses I love the idea about how can you know before you have the experience how many nurses will be helping you and what they will like. Great question. Um, I can see getting them something afterwards based on your experience, but I'm not sure about before unless you bring something generic like cookies for the entire floor. Yes, please bring some cookies. I don't know why I didn't think of this before because that was usually what people brought for us. If people are gonna bring something, they usually bring sweets. So I was always appreciative when they brought like a Trader Joe's basket of goodies that are like actually sustenance giving because there were times that like I didn't pee or I didn't eat a single thing but Oreos all night because the floor was so busy. So be thinking about like things that are yummy but that also potentially provide some caloric value to the nurses. Their brains will be sharper for you. Great idea, Wendy. As far as if you're trying to bring like actual nurses gifts, like a Starbucks card or something, expect, I always tell people eight, and that's a lot, I know. So if you have like, get two or three for your favorites, and if somebody really changes your life, let's hope they do, then you always have something for them. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Yeah, some of your ideas and some of your questions are like full YouTube videos. Like if I'm gonna do them justice, I'm gonna do like a full video on breech babies. I saw that come in, Kiata. Lezzy Duckwitz, how long after your estimated due date should you consider induction? Are there risks with waiting one to two weeks past your due date to be induced? I'm gonna try to simplify this one. Yes, there are risks in general. There are risks to everything. Um, there's risks to going early, there's risks to going late. So flex and flow with that one. But what I will say is that once you hit 42 weeks, which is two weeks past your due date, then you're kind of done, like your placenta gets old, it doesn't work as well, and it's just better for you to have your baby. There's really no benefit for the baby to be inside. And the placenta is what we love. I actually have it here from my class yesterday. We love our placenta because this is our baby's lifeline. The studies show that the blood flow to the baby after 42 weeks just doesn't do the same amount. The placenta peaks in performance at about 37 weeks, which is term. So you get 37 weeks, your placenta is like, ooh, I got this, let's do it. And it's been growing and, and working really well up until then and then once you get 37 weeks there's the kind of this slow decline to 42 weeks so expect that if you make it to 42 weeks your doctor is highly 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 going to recommend an induction ultimately that's your decision goal would be that you understand why you're making that decision and not just making one out of fear once you hit 41 weeks I will say especially from my experience most providers this is probably more provider specific than anything are going to recommend an induction there is some data that shows there's benefit to having the baby at 41 weeks and it's better to induce at 41 weeks um, but that kind of hard stop begins at 42 weeks and I like if I have clients and actually I do have lots of clients that wait past 41 weeks but once they hit 42 weeks I'm like when are we having the baby from a nursing perspective it does start to make me a little bit nervous life of a small town girl hello life of a small town girl what is the life like in a small town. Hey Sarah, question. If I was a big baby and my husband was a big baby, is our baby destined to be big? Nine pounds and then ten and a half pounds. Wow. God bless your mothers. We both were about two weeks late, which is most likely has something to do with our heavy birth weights also. A little scared, lol. Double heart. 
I think you're absolutely right. The fact that both your moms went overdue, definitely. Once your baby hits term, it really is just basically putting on weight, particularly past 39 weeks. It's like, now it's just adding weight and they say about a half a pound a week. The earlier you deliver, depending on when you go into labor, guaranteed you won't have as big of a baby. There is a tiny bit of a correlation between size of you and your partner with whether or not you make big babies, but it's not a guaranteed fact. So that one is definitely a flex and flow answer. I have, I, 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 I'm going to try to control myself related to big babies. Let me just say, I am finding, and I see all the time, and I hear about it all the time, that everybody is talked to about having a big baby, unless there's concern for the growth of the baby. The only way to know how big your baby is and whether or not it fits through your pelvis is by trying. No matter what the size, you just have to try because it may fit through the pelvis. There's so many different components related to size of baby and it fitting. And when doctors or midwives do the ultrasound and they do the estimated fetal weight and they say like, oh, your baby's six and a half pounds, that actually allows for a 10% margin of error on either side. So it's expected that they could be wrong by 10%. And six pounds, that's like almost a pound on either side. So if they say you're eight pounds, you could have a seven pound baby and that's like a perfectly normal, not even really big baby. Or you could have a nine pound baby and we're like, wow, that is a massive kid that just came out of you. The only way to know is by trying. So life of a small town girl, the answer is Maybe, but I wouldn't expect that in your brain and it's easy for the whole big baby thing to get in your brain and really potentially affect your capability or your thought process of believing what that you can do it. So I just encourage you to believe that your baby can fit, flex and flow and try, do everything you can and then if you get to the point where your baby doesn't fit, then you know you did everything you could to get the baby out. And that's usually the biggest concern when we talk about big baby. Now, the other concern is tearing and yeah, of course there's a correlation between tearing with really big babies, particularly big head. But the only way to know there is to try as well. I did a delivery in September where she was super tiny, I think eight four, which anything over eight pounds is like a good size baby, and she didn't tear. So I've seen it, and that was a first time mom, so flex and flow on that one. All right, this is on my bundle birth Instagram. And just so you know that on Instagram is usually where I'm interacting with you guys almost daily. So I try to get on there and like let you know what I'm up to. If I'm teaching a class, you'll know that that's up. I'm doing other little childbirth snippets on there, and so if I'm asking for a question for a video, you can find it and interact with me there. So this is crazy life of summer. Will you be able to do a video on postpartum care? I think she sent me a direct message on this one as well. Um, so postpartum care, the answer is yes, I will get there. It likely won't be for a while because my whole deal is birth. I do have a baby care class. I do deal with postpartum mamas. I have worked in postpartum. I will eventually get to some postpartum care ones, but it's not probably not gonna be for a minute. So this is expat. C, which I need to find you, expat. Are you an expat? Do you know what expat means? Because I'm an expat, not here, but I was. When you have to push, how long between each push can you wait? Impact on the baby. When you're pushing, you're actually pushing with the contraction. So how frequent your contractions are is what's going to be the gauge of how often to push. So if your contractions are every five minutes, you'll push every five minutes with the contraction. Between contractions, you're not really pushing. If your contractions are every minute, then you're pushing pretty much every minute unless your provider's telling you, eh, let's go every other just to give the baby a break because they are so frequent. How long between each push can you wait? I mean, you're the boss, so if you want to wait longer, the deal though with pushing is, is that the most effective pushes, imagine this is the head of the baby, the most effective pushes are ones that are long and hard, and the longer you wait between contractions, the longer chance that the head has to slip. Back. So the idea would be when you push, you want to push strong and regularly and forcefully during the contraction and then when the contraction's over, you hang out, you chill, you get that sip of water, you wait for the next one. As far as impact on the baby, when you push, it squeezes the baby's head a lot and they're like, uh, I'm stuck here and what is this? And some babies get stressed out by that and so in general like to go from inside the womb which is all you know to outside the womb and to the world of uh, life was rather stressful. I think a lot of times people are worried about how the baby breathes and your baby is connected to the umbilical cord which is still in your uterus so that's not normally being smushed while the baby's being smushed through the vagina and out to the world. They're still getting oxygen, they're still getting nutrients, they're just kind of smushed and then that goes back to your doctor telling you that you might need to wait to push, like you need to push every other contraction, and that if they see that there's an impact on the heart rate of the baby, which tells us oxygenation of the baby. Other than that, 
you just push your little heart out and you push when you need to push. If you need a break, then you tell your key team, I need a break, and they'll probably tell you, well, we're almost there, or keep pushing through, or if you take a break, we can wait this long. Remember that you have adrenaline, too, that kicks in at the end, and that it gives you that extra boost of energy to push your baby out. I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, that's what I have off the top of my head for that one. I'm gonna go to my Sarah Levon Instagram, because I did post it on both, and I think I probably got more responses on Sarah Levon one. Christine AMQT. QT. <laughs> That's cute. Can Braxton Hicks feel like menstrual cramps low in the abdomen? The quick answer is yes, they do. How do you keep your teeth so white? <laughs> uh, I brush them a lot and I use whitening toothpaste and I drink a lot of coffee. Cheers. Prin K says, is it okay to tell your nurses that you don't want students or interns in the room before and post labor? The answer is yes. Once again, you're the boss. Now, what I will say from a nursing perspective is that I was a student once and the way that I learned was from observing and being present and moms allowing me into the room. The same thing goes for doctors. And so most of the time when you're dealing with students, first of all, they should be telling you who they are and they should be asking permission to be in the room. Now, realistically speaking, does that always happen? Not always, but proper protocol. If you're a nursing student, please ask your patients if you can be in the room. Now, I am so grateful to all of the women and men that allowed me to be in their room for whatever it was through nursing school because that's what made me the nurse that I am today. But what I will say is that I also understand that it's uncomfortable that when you're exposed like that, when you're feeling extra vulnerable already, that to have extra eyeballs on your vagina or on you laboring and hopefully freely expressing yourself, however that is, that you need to be able to be in a space that feels safe and if you don't feel safe and I mean emotionally safe you should feel physically safe for sure you really can and should request that you don't have students in the room now remember they're in the room if they're performing something on you or actually doing a skill they'll always be supervised by somebody above them that can jump in and help if needed that's something you can put on a birth plan if you're interested in that so the answer is yes but I just have to disclaim for all the students and nurses even like nurses currently with experience out there that that's how we learn and that's how we grow and we are really so appreciative to be able to be let into that moment if you let us but it's your decision don't feel bad, do what you gotta do because that's your birthday, not theirs. And eight years later, I don't remember the births I was a part of in nursing school. It's your day and a your memory and it matters. So do what you gotta do. I did get a comment recently about anterior placenta. So I wanna talk about it real quick here. This is from Julie Davenport. She was not the only one, so if you wanted anterior placenta, then this is for you as well. I have a question. So I'm 26 week pregnant with baby number one, and I actually got an important question to ask. I found out five days ago that I have an anterior placenta. When I Googled it, I saw and found out really bad things about it from many websites, and when I asked my doctor, she said it's completely normal. I want to believe my doctor, but I don't know exactly what to believe. Please help. First of all, what is anterior placenta? When your body becomes pregnant, you grow this new organ called the placenta, and the placenta connects, it like attaches to the inside of the uterus, and that is where the blood flow happens to and from you and the baby. The placenta can attach anywhere on the uterus, Uterus, okay, it can go anywhere. Usually, for a reason I don't actually know the answer to, the placenta typically implants or connects to the uterus on the backside or what we call posterior side of the uterus. So if you were looking at me sideways and I was pregnant, the placenta would be facing this way on the back part of my uterus versus if I had a baby bump here, it would be on the front side. That would be considered an anterior placenta. I always tell my clients and my patients that Dr. Google is great, but you also have to know where to go for that correct information. And we don't want you stressing out any more than you need to. It's already stressful having a baby, so your doctor is somebody who did uh, go to school for this forever. It feels like this is why I'm not a doctor. To learn and study and be able to offer their expertise to you to take care of you and keep you safe. So yes, your doctor is an excellent resource to you, better than Dr. Google, okay? But what I'm gonna say is I also understand that it's hard because you hear all these things about trusting your doctor and is every doctor out there super trustworthy? No, they're not. You know, we're all selfish human beings. We all have our own motives behind our actions. Ultimately, your doctor is a resource to you, and in general, start there for going to information. Second of all, anterior placenta really doesn't mean much, honestly. It just means that the placenta is on the front of your uterus. Typically, with an anterior placenta, you're not going to feel the baby's movements the same, especially when we talk about doing kick counts that you should be doing later on in your pregnancy, that women who have an anterior placenta, they may say like, 
I don't know. I don't really feel much movement. Or my movements are not quite like you see on the like Instagram videos of like the little foot coming out and like the ooh, like the full rolls in your belly. You don't get quite the same amount of movement or sensation with an anterior placenta. Another reason why they just may ask you where your placenta is is in the case of a C-section because if it's on the front and on the lower side, it's possible that they make the incision over where the placenta is, and that would uh, require expediting your surgery a little bit quicker because we don't want to cut into your placenta if they can avoid it. So they want to know where your placenta is just as like an assessment up oh, noted but past that an anterior placenta means really nothing for you. It has very little impact if any on your pregnancy and mostly it's just the movements don't feel quite as gross meaning large or obvious that they would otherwise. Okay, I'm gonna go to like way back in the day and find one from a long time ago. Ex vica blah. At a normal tear, does it tear from like the cervix to the outer part through the whole vagina or does it only tear the outer skin? What we see from the outside but the vaginal tunnel stays intact. Such a good question. The question then is where does it tear? Well, first of all, it can tear anywhere. I said this in the vaginal tearing video. Like it could tear up the vaginal canal. I would say that's pretty abnormal. Sometimes if the baby comes down like with what we call a compound presentation, like a hand is by the head and they come out this way, they're like, down the vagina, but that would be more uncommon. Um, when we talk about tears, we're talking about the perineum, which is the space between the bottom of the vagina hole and the butthole. So that space like on the hole is likely going to tear this direction on the hole, like where you could actually see it and you could actually see the stitches after they stitch you up. But along the same lines, Amanda Roberts says, why does no one talk about the tears that involve the vagina hole or perineum? I had a secondary tear to my labia with both babies, different labia with different with each one, lucky me. Thank you for sharing, Amanda. Well, I am talking about the vagina hole or the perineum. So along those lines, it's the vagina hole that tears. It could tear into your labia depending on how the baby comes out and your own anatomy. But in general when we talk about tears we're talking about the perineum space which you can google that I'll give you permission to google that one yummy thanks everyone for being with me here today I'm Sarah Levon if you want more from me you can go to bundlebirth.com I got lots of stuff going on over there birth coaching other childbirth education coping with labor class which is newish and uh, something else that I do oh labor support if you're in LA or beyond I have virtual labor support services as well don't forget to connect on Instagram I was just on my Amazon storefront this morning of Obsessing over adding fun products for you my little shopping list on Amazon I'll have a link down below and you can go there and look at some items that I recommend for your labor for your birth for your pregnancy for your coffee bar Don't forget to subscribe down below I just learned recently from a recent subscriber where they said they turned on their little bell notification thing and sure enough I didn't even know but there's like this little bell guy that goes next to the subscribe button So once you subscribe you can click the little bell thing and then it'll notify you when I have a new video out Because Lord knows more are coming at ya real soon and maybe sooner than you thought because this was sooner than I thought. Love you a latte. That's what my cup says. Look, love you a latte. Like a lot. Love you a lot. Bye. Your baby will be the size that it is. That's a dumb thought. <laughs> oh boy. Oh. <laughs> my voice is so weird. <clears throat> Oh, where did the question go? Notification dinger thing are. Dinger. The dinger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that. That's where I pull out. Pull out. When you subscribe, then you know what's up. And you might not, then you won't miss them. I just, that's awkward. Turn on the little bell ball thing. The bell ball? What's the bell? The bell. The bell. The ring bell. Love you a latte. <laughs>